of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. After that, the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best uh, way is the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced in the religion. And every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of Islam is a bid'ah or an innovation. And all of these religious innovations are misguidance. All misguidance is going astray and all going astray is in the fire. Every nation is characterized at least partially by its customs, its morals, its manners. In, in England, we have a set of manners, we call them etiquettes, rules of behavior. And it's very interesting that when you study the history of etiquettes, and you study the etiquettes in England, you find in fact that the whole system has been devised in order to make a division between people. It's been devised to make a division between people. It's been devised to make a division between the upper classes and the lower classes. So the upper classes, they invent the etiquettes. You know, for example, how you should hold your knife and fork. Uh, how you should talk, the words you should say, the type of clothes that you should wear. The upper classes, they invent these etiquettes. And so the people in the middle classes, the middle upper classes, they want to imitate the higher class people. They want to emulate them. So they try to copy their etiquettes. But of course what the upper class do is they change the rules every now and then to catch out those people who are trying to imitate them and thus they are able to make them a laughing stock and reinforce this division between the classes. So actually the manners of at least we could say in England, the rules and etiquettes actually cause division and distance one group of people from another. Well, we Muslims have also our etiquettes. We also have manners that have been instituted for us by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, this knowledge was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Allah. But the beautiful thing, when you look at our manners, when you look at our customs, you find that they have actually been designed to bring people together. Actually to break down the barriers, the artificial barriers of class, of wealth, of color. And they have been made in a way to actually bring us close together. So when the Prophet وسلم, for example, was on one particular expedition and the companions, they were camping. One group over here, one group over there. So they spread out all over the valley. And the Prophet وسلم, when he saw this, he said to them, your spreading out is from shaitan. Your spreading out is from shaitan. And after that, whenever they used to sit together, when they used to sit in a gathering, or whenever they used to you know, be in a place, they would come together very closely. In fact, it said that you could spread a cloth on top of their heads and it would have stayed off the ground. Because there is a connection between what you display outwardly 
and how you are inwardly. If we are close together physically and we sit together, this reinforces physically the condition that should be inside ourselves internally. The condition of unity, the condition of being close together, the condition of feeling close to one another. This is a very important aspect of our religion. The Muslims are one Ummah. We are like one body. If one part of this body feels pain, then the whole of the body is restless and cannot sleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً That verily the believers are brothers. We are a brotherhood. We are a family. This should be the reality of this ummah. Even the word ummah comes from um, the Arabic word for mother. But what is the condition that we find this ummah in? Do we find ourselves like one body? In fact, we find ourselves very disunited. We find ourselves very fragmented in many different ways. Of course, the most fundamental fragmentation is even in the most essential of all matters and that is the aqidah, the belief of the Muslim. In fact, you would imagine that this would be one thing where a Muslim could never be disunited. How could we have variance upon such an essential and important matter? Yet you find on even this essential, most essential and important matter, we are at variance. And the differences between us go on and on. We find when the Prophet ﷺ, he is teaching the Muslims how to stand in the salah. Look at our salah. Look at this prayer. How we stand in rows. Shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet. Straighten the lines so Allah will straighten your hearts. Again, the connection between what is outward and what is inside. Close the gaps so the shaitan does not come between you. Again, being close together is a means of preventing shaitan from overcoming us. And this is the emphasis the Prophet ﷺ gave to the salah in jama'ah. If there are three of you living in a valley and you don't meet together to establish the prayer, meaning you establish the prayer together in jama'ah, if you do not do that, shaitan has got hold of you. Meaning in being divided, in not meeting, in not coming together, is the means for shaitan to divide you. Again, physical proximity, the actual physical outward appearance of coming together has a connection to what is inside ourselves. And so we find this month of Ramadan has come. This blessed month. This sacred month. And we find ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for all of those who are here, we have really been blessed by Allah that He has allowed us the opportunity to experience and to reap the benefits of this month of Ramadan. But really what is going to concern me today? that I want to talk about today is how many of us really understand what Ramadan is about and how many of us if we fail to understand what Ramadan is really about how can we possibly take advantage of it because one of the things that I have noticed in my 20 years as a Muslim and I'm sure you all have noticed this as well. 
amongst many different things, and I've mentioned it already, is the disunity and the fragmentation of the Muslims. And not only that, one of the things that I have noticed is that many Muslims, it seems to me, follow Islam in a very ritualistic way. And when I say ritualistic, I mean it in the sense that many of us seem to follow the patterns of Islam, the outward aspects of Islam. So we pray, we make the movements of prayer, we make the appearance of going to the mosque, we fast the Ramadan. In many cases, we even wear the dress of the Muslim. Perhaps even we grow our beards and wear hijab. But it seems that in some cases, maybe even I would dare to say in many cases, it is just like a shell, an outward shell. Inside there is little or perhaps even nothing. I'm reminded of a hadith where some people came to ask the Prophet وسلم, about a certain woman. And this certain woman was known to pray many extra prayers and also to do many extra fasts. So she was a woman who was known for praying and fasting. But they said to the Prophet وسلم, but she speaks badly. You know, her tongue is evil. And she says bad things about her neighbors. And the Prophet ﷺ said, she is a person of the hellfire. She prays extra prayers and fasts extra fasts. But there was something very corrupt in her behavior. So we should be very careful, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, may Allah have mercy upon you. We should be very careful. We should be warned and we should take heed from something the Prophet ﷺ told us. That it may be that a person gets nothing from their fast except hunger and thirst. And it may be that a person gets nothing from their prayers except they get tired. It may be that all we achieve at the end of Ramadan is that we spent 30 days being hungry and being thirsty. We spent 30, day, 30 nights, 29 nights standing up and all we got from that was we got tired. We were tired. And it may be that all we get from our fasting and from our prayers is hunger and thirst and tiredness. This is not achieving anything. How is it? And you know what I'm talking about. You know we you know what I'm talking about. If I say to you Ramadan Muslim. You know what I mean. You know the Muslims who only really practice Islam in Ramadan. In Ramadan and only in Ramadan they pray five times a day. In Ramadan they let their beards grow. In Ramadan they wear the hijab. In Ramadan they pray at the night. In Ramadan they give charity. In Ramadan they fast. So they really follow Islam in Ramadan. And even maybe they will try to give up some bad things. But when Ramadan has finished, they just go back to what they were doing before. What is happening? There's something, it seems to me, very wrong. It seems to me there is something very wrong with us. If we are the same Muslim after Ramadan as we were before Ramadan, it seems to me.
that if Ramadan has not changed us, has not made us better Muslims, then there is something very wrong with our Ramadan. If this happens regularly, constantly, then it seems to me there is something much more fundamental. That many of us perhaps are just going through the movements, going through the process, and it's as if Islam is just part of our culture. We do these things in the same way that we eat, you know, curry or we eat, you know, whatever is chapati or whatever it is, you know, roast beef, whatever our culture is, right? We, that's just our habit. It's our custom. And it seems maybe for some of us, Islam is just a custom. We don't really understand what is supposed to be going on. We don't really comprehend that all of this is about us and our relationship with our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It seems as if we are not connected with the reality of that day when we are going to stand in front of Allah and He is going to ask us about every single thing that we have done and every atom's weight of good that we have done, we will know about it. And every atom's weight of evil we have done, we will know about it. We, see, we don't seem connected with that reality. If we understood our Lord, if we understood truly who is Allah, truly what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if we really truly understood about our prayer and our fasting and our charity and our hajj and all of these things, then we would find as an ummah, we would find as people, we would be becoming better and better as Muslims. As each Ramadan passes, we would be coming as Muslims, we would be becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells us in the Qur'an, He actually tells us the purpose of fasting. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as O oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as, the, as it was prescribed to those who came before you. So you may acquire taqwa. So there it is. Allah tells us why fasting has been prescribed for us. So that you and me, so we can acquire taqwa. Now, let's think about this. I'm sure you've all, brothers and sisters, been shopping in a supermarket. You've all been to a supermarket? Yes? So you go to the supermarket and you get your trolley. You have to put a pound coin in, right? So you go, you get your trolley. And when you go in the supermarket, the trolley is empty. Yeah? Okay. So you go to the supermarket you push your trolley, your empty trolley, through the supermarket, and then you walk out of the supermarket, and after one hour, the trolley is still empty. Now I've got a question. What did you get from your one hour in the supermarket? The trolley was empty, and it came out empty. So what did you get? Huh? Nothing. You got nothing. Okay? Now let's think about it. Okay? Ramadan is beginning. Ramadan is beginning. Now every one of us right now, only, what, it's a week, yes? First week. So we've still got, how many more days left? 23 something days, okay? So, We've got, still the majority of Ramadan is left. It's not too late. So the first thing we have to do is this. 
we have to make an assessment of ourselves. We should have done this already. As Ramadan was coming, but I know we're just too busy, right? Most of us, I guess, Ramadan just like arrived and it was like, what, it's Ramadan tomorrow? That sounds familiar. I can see some people smiling like that's exactly what went through my head. But you know, before Ramadan, we should have done this already. It is the time to make an assessment of yourself. An assessment of your level of Iman, your level of Taqwa. You should make an assessment. If you haven't done it, it's not too late. You can still do it. What I mean is think about yourself. Think about your life. Okay? Let's take the basic things. Let's take your Salah. When you pray, first of all, do you pray five times a day? I'm not asking, by the way, for any answers. I'm asking you to assess yourself. Okay? Do you pray five times a day? I mean, that should, by the way, not even be an issue. I mean, if you are Muslim, you have to pray five times a day. You don't have a choice. Do you pray on time? Do you pray at the earliest time? Do you pray every fard salah if you're a man in the masjid, in jama'ah? Do you do that? When you say your prayers, what is the prayer like? Are you just bowing and prostrating and saying some words you don't understand? Or do you come out of that prayer feeling closer to Allah? Does that prayer make you fear Allah? Does it make you mindful of Allah? Do you have khushu' in your prayer? Make an assessment of your prayer, your charity, your zakah. How much charity have you given this year? How much money have you donated? I mean, we Muslims, we are in desperate need. All over the Muslims, all over the world are in desperate need. And we, all of us, even the most poor of us in this country, live comfortable lives. How much charity did you give? Did you do extra fasts? Okay, your tongue. This tongue. What has your tongue been earning for yourself? Have you been enjoining the right and forbidding the wrong? Have you been giving dawah? Have you been talking to those people around you, your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues about Islam? Have you enjoined the right and forbidden the wrong? Has the Quran, has the tongue been busy with dhikr of Allah, with, with reading Quran? With making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What has or has this tongue been busy swearing and lying and breaking promises? Make an assessment of yourself. These eyes, what have they been looking at? Beautiful girls, good looking guys, movies, TV, haram. What have the eyes been looking at? You know, you make an assessment of yourself. These ears, what have they listened to? Music? Singing? Evil speech? What have these ears been listening to? Make an assessment of yourself. You know yourself. Your feet. Where did they walk to? What have they walked from? These hands. What have they contributed to? Think about your life. What have you been doing with your life up until now? Your time that is so precious. And what are we, my brothers and sisters, but numbered days? Think about that. What are we? We, you and me are numbered days. Think of yourself as a num. A, 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 that's it. Numbered days. You know, like in a calendar, those ones you just take the piece of paper off. Yeah. You are. Who knows? You don't even know how thick you are. How many days you've got on that calendar? Is it this? Is it that? Is it this? But every day, one of those days is going. You're getting closer to the end of that. Maybe today is the last day. You don't know. All we are, brothers and sisters, is numbered days. Time is very precious. What did you do with your time? What did you do with this time Allah has given you? Your health is something Allah has blessed you with. We have the opportunity in this society to eat the most healthy foods, to provide our body with every vitamin. Even we have scientists who have informed us about all the types of vitamins and nutrients we need. Have we filled our body? Have we cared for this body that Allah has given us? Have we looked after our health? Have we exercised it as it's the right of our body? Have we looked, given the right to our body? Or what have we done? Filled it with junk? Assess yourself, brothers.
Assess yourself, sisters. <clears throat> what have you done with yourself? In, now you have to make a measure of yourself. How was it before Ramadan? Why? Because we want to see how full your trolley is already. Okay? You want to see how full it is. What is inside it? And you want to know why you made the assessment. Because you want to know now, brothers and sisters, that when Ramadan finishes, you want to see what has changed about you. And what is going to stay permanently changed about you. Now, if you have, if you now start Ramadan, if you start your Ramadan thinking this way, Ramadan has come. I want to make sure that when Ramadan has finished, I have improved myself and made myself a better Muslim. And that in the year to come, between this Ramadan and the next, I will maintain that, maybe even improve it. And then the next Ramadan, I will improve myself a little bit more. You see, now if you start Ramadan with this mentality, now you know what Ramadan is for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may acquire taqwa. Now Allah has ordained for us this fantastic month in order that we can be better. We can improve ourselves. We can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason for it. Now we're going to examine how Ramadan does that. How does Ramadan allow us to acquire taqwa. First of all, very quickly, what is taqwa? It's important to know. What is taqwa? We could say it is the fear of Allah or the consciousness of Allah. But taqwa really means a shield. It is a shield. And that the word taqwa is rooted from an Arabic word which means shield. So it is a shield. It is the shield that guards us and protects us from Allah's punishment. So taqwa is that which will protect you from the punishment and from the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more taqwa you have, the more protected you are from Allah's punishment. So taqwa is to do acts of obedience to Allah with a light from Allah, hoping for Allah's reward. And it is to leave disobedience to Allah with a light from Allah, hoping for Allah's, fearing Allah's punishment, excuse me. So this is taqwa. Or another example, taqwa, imagine if you have a path covered in thorns. You know the brambles? You know those brambles? They grow everywhere, especially this summer. You see lots of them. So if you walk down a path, you don't have to go far here. If any of you ever go to the countryside, you don't have to go fight, just walk that way a bit, and there you are, you're in the countryside. So you walk down a path covered in thorns. Okay, how do you walk down a path like that? How do you go down such a path? Huh? You go carefully, right? You're careful. If the thorns you pick them, you go, you're just careful that these thorns don't catch your clothes and rip your clothes. This is taqwa. I don't mean taqwa means going to the countryside and walking down. Meaning, a person who has taqwa is very, very careful how they go through life. They are careful of the things that are haram and that can harm them. So, Ramadan will increase you in this. Being very careful to keep away from those things that will harm you before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So how is Ramadan going to help us increase in taqwa? How is Ramadan going to help us to do good deeds and to keep away from evil deeds? First thing, one of the amazing things about this month is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chained the shayateen. So that means that the shayateen, the devils who whisper to us and who tempt us and who provoke us, and who call out to our nafs and our desires and appeal to our passions 
Now these shayateen have now been chained. They have been restrained. Now according to some scholars, it doesn't mean they can't bother you at all. They can still bother you. But the influence they can have on you is very small. It's maybe very reduced a lot. So, the shayateen have been chained. That's the first thing. So it makes it a lot easier. You don't have that nagging thing. It's gone now. So it's easier for you to do good deeds. Also, the gates of paradise are open and the gates of the hellfire are closed. So in this month, Allah has made the ways to paradise easy and the ways to hellfire difficult. So this is a type of spiritual blessing of this month. To make it easier for us to do good deeds. Then, in the actual physical act of fasting, we have restrained ourselves from eating and from drinking and from intimate relations. Just the sheer fact of doing that itself is, as obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually teaching us something very important. It is teaching us to restrain our physical appetites, our passions. It is actually a real physical restraint of our passions and desires. So it's teaching us, look, if you can stop eating and drinking and not have intimate relations from 5 o'clock in the morning or 5.15 or 5.20 in the morning until 7 o'clock at night, if you can do that every single day for 30 days, wait a minute, that, that means you can control yourself. You are learning self-control. If you can control those desires, you can control other desires. You are learning. It is teaching you. You can do it. And a lot of the time, brothers and sisters, that's what it's about. You can do it. You can achieve it. Don't think that you can't. <clears throat> and especially living in this society where we are immersed and surrounded by disobedience to Allah, by people who are doing all sorts of things that contradict the divine guidance. But no, you, you can abstain from that. You can keep away from it. And Ramadan is teaching you that, my brothers and sisters, that you can do it. And the other thing is, of course, is very important. Community. You know, when you're fasting with others and you're praying with others and you're breaking fast with your brothers and sisters. And this is why gatherings like this are so important. They are so blessed. It is so, I have to say, I walked in here and straight away, I just felt so happy to see, mashallah, so many, you know, brothers and sisters. Mashallah, it's fantastic. Makes you feel so glad. And when we eat together and break fast together, you know, this is going to reinforce within us the unity of the Muslims. You know, it teaches us, doesn't it? You know how, mashallah, you see the brotherhood in Ramadan. Don't you see, don't you feel that brotherhood when we're all breaking fast? I remember there was a mosque I used to go to. We always had problems in that mosque. You know, different brothers were always having problems in that mosque. But in Ramadan, somehow, everyone... You know, they frown at you the rest of the year, right? But in Ramadan, they're smiling and ya akhi and this and that. And wait a minute, if you can do that in Ramadan, it means you can keep doing it. You can maintain it. You can achieve it. And you know, when we do things together, it's very important. I don't know if, you know, let's remember when we were kids, right? I don't know if any of you had a bicycle or, you know, but... You know, kids do crazy things, right? And they egg each other on to do more crazy things. So if you ever had a bicycle and you were with a group of kids, you know, I'm sure you tried some stunts, right? You must have tried, you know, setting up a jump and seeing how far you could jump or do see how far you could wheelie or doing some crazy stuff, you know, jumping from a tree. You know, maybe you didn't have a bike, but you must have done something. You know, climbing on top of the cupboards. Now, if you're just on your own by yourself, Right? It's just you. 100%. Right? You may try some things. But if you're with a group of people and everyone is egging you on and encouraging you, you are going to do some crazy stuff that you never would have thought of even doing by yourself. True or not? 
Yeah? Okay, it's true. Yeah, yes, says one. <laughs> Here's my arm, I broke it to prove it. So, you know, it's actually the same in a positive sense. We as Muslims should be encouraging each other to do really pious things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do really righteous things. Subhanallah, look, if that brother can grow his beard, that sister can wear hijab, I can do it too. You know, if they can do this, I can do it. If they can give that much charity, inshallah, I can give more charity as well. You know, if I can give up doing the haram or give up taking a mortgage or whatever, oh, I can do it as well. If that's why it's so important to enjoin the right and to, to forbid the wrong, to encourage each other, to make ta'awan, to encourage each other in righteousness and good deeds and not to encourage each other in evil and transgression. But you know, Ramadan, because we're together, inshallah, this community aspect is very important. So we encourage each other. And it is also, of course, Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I'm sure you know, used to read the whole Qur'an in Ramadan. And in the last Ramadan before he died, he read it twice. Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. It's the month in which the Qur'an was brought down. From the Loh al-Mahfuz to the, the, the house, I don't remember, Bayt al Maqam or whatever, the house. Anyway, it was brought down and then it was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Jibreel. So, it is the month of the Qur'an. And the scholars of the past, you know, they used to leave aside the other books. Put aside the other books. And in the month of Ramadan, emphasize and concentrate on the Qur'an. Now, I came across a saying recently of Abdullah ibn Mubarak. And he said that the right of the Qur'an, it's right. Meaning, what's the opposite of the right? When I give something, it's right. What's the opposite of giving something, it's right? Huh? Yeah, okay, giving something it's wrong, we don't call it that. We don't say giving something it's wrong. We call it, we call it oppressing. When you deny someone their rights, you are oppressing them. Yes? If you have a person who works for you, what is the right of that person? That person works for you, what is their right? They get paid. There you go, straight away. No confusion about that. A person works for you, it is their right that they get paid. If you don't pay them, you've oppressed them. Yes? Okay. So what is the right of the Qur'an? Abdullah ibn Mubarak said, the right of the Qur'an is that we should read 100 ayat every day. That's what he said. The right of the Qur'an is to read 100 ayat every day. That means that we are doing some type of dhulam on the Qur'an. If we are not reading a hundred ayat, this is his opinion, but it's something we should think about. How many of us are doing that, brothers? I mean, even the bearded brothers and hijab sisters. Huh? How many of us read one hundred ayat of Qur'an every day? That's what Abdullah ibn Murak said, it's his right. Okay. Now Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. This is the month when all of us should pick up the Qur'an and concentrate on reading it, on memorizing it, on understanding it. And so let's just take a simple step. Because one of the things I really want to emphasize, my brothers and sisters, is this. It is very unlikely, and I question whether it's effective or even healthy, that Ramadan will come and it will transform you completely. And you'll become like a wali. You know, the deeds that Allah loves best are those deeds that are regular. They are done regularly, even if they are little. So make for yourself an ambition and an intention to do something that is achievable, that you know that you can achieve it. It's better than what you were doing before, 
But by the time Ramadan has finished, finished, you are going to commit yourself to this one simple thing. So if you don't read the Quran regularly every day, it's probably going to be almost impossible for you to start reading 100 ayat every day. I don't think you can manage it. But you know what you can manage? Every one of us in this room, inshallah, and in, in the back room. I think you can manage to read, if you're not doing it already, one page a day. Of whatever Quran you have, inshallah, English, Arabic, English, Urdu, whatever, one page a day. Read the Arabic, read the translation. For those of us who can read Arabic. There you go. One page a day. And this Ramadan, you are going to do your best to try and finish the Quran. Maybe you won't, but you're going to try to do your best to finish the Quran. Not one page a day. In Ramadan, you're going to read as much as you can. Every moment you get free, you will be picking up the Quran and reading it. Try, try to finish the Quran. By the end of Ramadan, then you will make your, you will follow through one page a day if you're already doing one page or two pages then what you do is you increase it you increase it by one page or two page not dramatically just a little bit now that's achievable and that means that by the time you've come out of Ramadan you have established something in Ramadan and inshallah you have maintained you have improved yourself by one thing but I'm not saying you just stop at one thing you make an assessment of yourself how much sadaqah are you giving are you do you have direct debits coming out okay if it's two pounds five pounds fifteen pounds increase it but make sure in Ramadan you give generously give generously in Ramadan much more than you normally would but when the Ramadan is finished, make sure that whatever you are doing before, it has increased and stay, stays increased. The same with your salah. The same with your tongue. Increase the good things that you say. Increase your dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Increase the dua. Increase it. And that's the good things. And as for the bad, okay, it's very important. You must know this. That Ramadan is not just about abstaining from food and drink. No. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that the person, that Allah has no need of a person to abstain from eating and drinking who does not abstain from evil in their speech and action. Now, you know, it's very interesting, this hadith. Because... I don't think we have a measure. I mean, we know from the point of view of fiqh, we know the things that break our fast. We know the things that break our fast. There are definite certain things that break our fast. There are definite certain things that break our wudu. There are definite certain things that break our salah. We, you know, we know them. They are known. But how much... Lying breaks your fast. One lie, two lies, three hundred lies. How much swearing breaks your fast? I mean, how much do you have to do before your fast is worthless? Allah is not interested. Allah has no need of a person. In other words, you might as well not bother, although you still have to do it. Of course you do. Why? Because you don't know what the measure is. You don't know what it is. We don't have anything to measure specifically how much evil breaks the fast. So you still have to keep your fast. But what is the lesson is that the fasting has an inner dimension. It is supposed to transform us inwardly. That if you're abstaining from food and drink and intimate relations... If your fasting does not also cause you to give up swearing, lying, breaking your promises, cheating, stealing, etc., etc., then what sort of fast is it? It's a hollow fast. It's an empty fast. It's a fast that has no real benefit. 
maybe then you'll be one of those people that gets nothing from the fasting except that you get hungry and you get thirsty and you get nothing from your night prayers except that you get tired. So we, sh we must make sure that not only do we increase in our good, like I said, make a measure, you know how evil your life has been in the last year. So you're going to reduce that evil. You're going to give up that evil. You know what? Because you, you've done it already. You gave it up in Ramadan. I mean, let's take smoking, for example. I cannot understand that. How can any Muslim smoke? First of all, how does any Muslim smoke? I don't know. Number And every packet says, smoking kills. Does anyone imagine it is halal to kill yourself? I mean, there are people who say it's makruh. I don't know, maybe they were taking a 300-year-old fatwa to say it was makruh. But today we know that smoking kills you. Is it halal to drink poison? Is it halal to drink poison and kill yourself? Is it permissible to do that? What if you do it bit by bit, you drink a little poison every day? Does it make any difference? How can you smoke? It's very strange. Training for hellfire, that's what I call it. You know, If you want to put smoke in your lungs, maybe you're training for hellfire. But you know what? The other really strange thing to me is that if you can stop smoking from 5 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock at night, that means you can give up smoking. Every single day in Ramadan, a message is coming to you, you can give up. You've proven it in your action. When you can stop from 7 until 5, there is nothing anymore that is making you continue after that. And you know when the fasting comes in summer, we're going to be fasting 16 hours. You're telling me if you cannot smoke for 16 hours, you can't give up? I mean, and think about that for the rest of the evil deeds. That's what Ramadan is teaching you. You can give up the evil. You can abstain from it. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So this is what we should be learning from Ramadan. How easy it is to give up evil. How easy it is to, get, to do good. And we have these 30 days to get us into the habit of doing good. To get us into the habit of keeping away from evil. And so the sign, my brothers and sisters... Of your Ramadan being an accepted Ramadan, meaning it's something that Allah has accepted it. Because that's something we always have to think about. We should always be worried. Did Allah accept my deeds or not? Did Allah accept my fasting? Did Allah accept my prayer? Did Allah accept my charity? Has Allah accepted my deeds? We, we should be very, very, very concerned about that. You know, the people... The, the, the pious people in the past, they would be just as concerned about their intentions, are they right, about whether Allah had accepted the deed or not. They would be as concerned with that as in fact the deed itself. They would be very, very careful to make sure they didn't do something to nullify, to make useless their deeds. So we want to see, what is the sign that Allah has accepted your Ramadan. The sign is that you continue in goodness after Ramadan has finished. Night prayers. I mean, maybe some of us think about tahajjud as something that only saints do. But every night, every night in Ramadan, you stood behind the Imam and you prayed for an hour how many raka but you prayed for an hour an hour and a half an hour and 45 minutes you stood behind the Imam and you prayed why does that finish when Ramadan finishes why why do you think it has to finish why don't you keep praying because you know you can do it so continue to do it 
That's what Ramadan is there for, my brothers and sisters, to, to teach us all of these amazing things. And how much we learn from Ramadan, how much we learn and we can benefit from brotherhood of the Muslims, from the unity of the Muslims, from increasing in our ibadah, from abstaining from the evil things, from coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what we should be getting, every one of us, from Ramadan. And if it comes, my brothers and sisters, that once Ramadan has finished, and you find one week, two weeks have gone by, and really nothing has changed in your life at all, you have to really wonder, what happened to my Ramadan? Did I really reap the benefits of that month? How much have I changed? So my brothers and sisters, let's make this a Ramadan that changes us. It may not change us a lot, but let's make sure at least it has changed us and made us better Muslims and closer to Allah. And if Allah gives us life and we manage to live and we see another Ramadan, then that Ramadan will be another opportunity to bring us again closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that way, inshallah, individually and collectively, we will see a change in ourselves. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakallah khair. Is there any questions that can be asked? Just raise your hands and ask. You're only reading the Quran if you're reading it in Arabic. Because it's not Quran in English. The Quran is not the Quran in English. The, the benefit of reading the Quran in terms of its blessing, and this is something it should be emphasized. Yes, the Quran is to be understood. We should and must try to understand the Quran. Allah tells us, This is the book. Without doubt, guidance for the pious people. So the Quran is guidance. So it's a book to guide us. It's a book to be understood. And Allah made it easy to understand. But there is a blessing that only Allah knows of reading this Quran in Arabic. And as the Prophet ﷺ told us, that for every alif, every letter that we read of the Qur'an, there is a blessing, there is a blessing in it. And this is only for reading the Qur'an in Arabic. That's why it is an act of ibadah to read the Qur'an in Arabic, even if you don't understand it. But, I would emphasize that it is very important also to try to also understand the Qur'an and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us. It's not either or. Why does there have to be either or? It's not an option. You should both read it in Arabic and try to understand it. Now, what if you don't know Arabic? Then what better time to learn Arabic and learn to read Arabic than the month of Ramadan? So meaning, if, if you're not even at the stage when you can read Arabic yet, no problem, don't worry. This is the time, Ramadan is the, the very good time to start learning to read Arabic. Yes? Inshallah. So, every one of us, if we don't know Arabic, you're not, don't think you're, I'm too old. You're not too old, you're never too old, inshallah. And even if you have difficulty reading the Quran, anyway, there is twice, you know, there is a double reward for the person who reads the Quran and finds it difficult. Yes. Which made her to enter hellfire. Mm. Does it apply vice versa? In such a way that the one who does all good things, like behaving good to others, mm. not talking any bad things, but not praying or not asking. No, it doesn't mean. <laughs> 
It doesn't mean that. But you know, really, if you think about it, I would really want to know. Um, we, I mentioned about giving everything its right. Yes. So if you are really a person who is polite to everybody, yeah, and does not speak bad about people, and you do all the good things, what you do all the good things in respect to people, and you forget Allah, you forget your Lord. You forget the one who has created you and who has given you everything. How about what is due to Allah by way of thanks to him, by way of praise to him? So really a person whose tongue abstains from praising Allah, whose body abstains from bowing and prostrating before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a person who is immersed in evil. Because they, they are not giving to Allah the right that is due to him. And his right is the one that is most worthy of being, being given. And it's really similar to the last one. It shouldn't be one or the other. The Muslim gives the right to Allah and the right to the creation. That is part of what is the Islamic character, the Muslim personality. We give our right to Allah and we give the right to the creation. You know the saying of the Prophet wasallam: the person who does not thank the people does not thank Allah. It's showing that it is part of being grateful to Allah that we are grateful to the creation. It is part of the completeness of the Muslim's character. Okay? Uh, and it goes without saying, if you are a Muslim, you pray and you fast. If you are a Muslim, you pray and you fast. You can, if you don't do those things, you're not a Muslim. Yes? But on top of that, a Muslim makes sure that people are safe from their tongue and from their hand. Yes? A Muslim also makes sure that people are safe from their tongues and from their hands.